Who were the Silurais? The Silurais were an ancient Brythonic tribe occupying what is now South Wales and parts of the English border region. But who were these people? Everything we know about them comes to us from the Romans and that is just a story from a brief moment in time. The Romans battle against the leader Caractacus or as we call him in Wales, Caradog. In this documentary I want to try and discover who the real people were. Although Tacitus' description of the Sururas does paint a picture, I don't believe it tells the whole picture. But let's use this as a starting point on our journey. Let's hear from the words of Tacitus himself. The defeat of the Iceni quieted those who were hesitating between war and peace. Then the army was marched against the Kangi. Their territory was ravaged, spoil taken everywhere without the enemy venturing on an engagement. Or if they attempted to harass our march by stealthily attacks, their cunning was always punished. And now, Ostorius had advanced within a little distance of the sea. He was facing the island of Hibernia, when feuds broke out amongst the Brigantes and compelled the general's return. For it was his fixed purpose not to undertake any fresh enterprise till he had consolidated his previous successes. The Brigantes indeed, when a few who were beginning hostilities had been slain and the rest pardoned, settled down quietly. But on the Saluras, neither terror nor mercy had the least effect. They persisted in war and could only be quelled by legions encamped in their country. That this might be the more promptly affected, a colony of strong body veterans was established at Camaladunum on the conquered lands, as a defence against the rebels and as a means of imbuing the allies with respect for our laws. The army then marched against the Silures, a naturally fierce people, now full of confidence in the might of Caractacus, who by many an indecisive and many successful battle had raised himself above all the other generals of Britain. Inferior in military strength, but deriving an advantage from the deceptiveness of their country, into the territory of the Ordovices, where joined by all who dreaded peace with us, he resolved on a final struggle. He selected a position for engagement, in which advance and retreat alike would be difficult for our men and comparatively easy for his own. And then, on some lofty hills, wherever the sides could be approached by a gentle slope, he piled up stones to serve as a rampart. A river too of varying depth was in his front, and his armed bands were drawn up before his defences. Then too, the chieftains of several tribes went from rank to rank, encouraging and confirming the spirit of their men by making light of their fear and kindling their hopes. As for Caractacus, he flew hither and thither, protesting that the day and the battle would be the beginning of the recovery of their freedom, or of everlasting bondage. He appealed to each warrior by name, appealing to their forefathers who had driven back the dictator Caesar. While he was thus speaking, the horse shouted applause. Every warrior bound himself by his national oath not to shrink from weapons or wounds. Such enthusiasm confounded the Roman general. The frowning hilltops, the stern resistance, and the masses of fighting men everywhere apparent daunted him. But his soldiers insisted on battle exclaiming that valour could overcome all things. Ostorius, having ascertained a survey of the inaccessible and assailable points of the position, led on his furious men and crossed the river without difficulty. When he reached the barrier, as long as it was a fight with missiles, the wounds and the slaughter fell chiefly on our soldiers. But when he had formed the military testudo and the rude, ill-compacted fence of stones was torn down, and it was a hand-to-hand -hand engagement, the barbarians retired to the heights. Yet, even there, both light and heavy-armed soldiers rushed to the attack, while the latter closed with them, and the opposing ranks of the Britons were broken. Destitute as they were of the defence of breastplates or helmets, when they faced the auxiliaries, they were felled by swords and javelins. If they wheeled round, they were again met by sabres and spears of the auxiliaries. It was a glorious victory. The wife and daughter of Caractacus were captured, and his brothers too were admitted to surrender. There is seldom safety for the unfortunate, 
and Caractacus, seeking the protection of Cartus Manduna, the queen of the Brigantes, was put in chains and delivered up to the conquerors, and promptly taken to Rome. All were eager to see this great man, who for so many years had defied our power. Even at Rome, the name of Caractacus is no obscure one. The people were summoned as to a grand spectacle. The Praetorian cohorts were drawn up under arms in the plain in front of their camp. Then came a procession of the royal vassals, and ornaments and neck chains and the spoils of which the king had won in wars with other tribes were displayed. Next were to be seen his brothers, his wife and daughter, last of all, Caractacus himself. When he was set before the emperor's tribunal, he spoke as follows. Had my moderation in prosperity been equal to my noble birth and fortune, I should have entered the city as your friend rather than as your captive, and you would not have disdained to receive under a treaty of peace a king descended from illustrious ancestors and ruling many nations. My present lot is as glorious to you as it is degrading to myself. I had men and horses, arms and wealth, what wonder if I parted with them reluctantly? If you Romans choose to lord it over the world, does it follow that the world is to accept slavery? Were I to have been once delivered up as a prisoner, neither my fall nor your triumph would have become famous. My punishment would be followed by oblivion. Whereas, if you save my life, I shall be an everlasting memorial of your clemency. Upon this, the emperor granted pardon to Caractacus, to his wife and to his brothers. Released from their bonds, they did homage to Agrippina, who sat near, conspicuous on another throne in the same language of praise and gratitude. It was indeed a novelty, quite alien to ancient manners, for a woman to sit in front of Roman standards. In fact, Agrippina boasted that she herself was a partner in the empire of which her ancestors won. Triumphal distinctions were voted to Astorius, who thus far had been successful, but soon afterwards met with the reverse. Either because, when Caractacus was out of the way, our discipline was relaxed under an impression that the war was ended, or because the enemy, out of compassion for so great a king, was more ardent in his thirst for vengeance. Instantly they rushed from all parts on the camp prefect, and legionary cohorts left to establish fortified positions among the Siluras. And had not speedy succor arrived from the towns and fortresses in the neighbourhood, our forces would have been totally destroyed. Even as it was, the camp prefect, with eight centurions and the bravest of all soldiers, was slain, and shortly afterwards a foraging party of our men with some cavalry squadrons sent to their support were utterly routed. Astorius then deployed his light cohorts, but even thus he did not stop the flight till our legions sustained the brunt of the battle. Their strength equalized the conflict, which after a while was in our favor. The enemy fled with trifling loss as the day was on the decline. Now began a series of skirmishes, for the most part like raids. In woods and morasses, with encounters due to chance or to courage, to mere heedlessness or to calculation, to fury or lust of plunder, under directions from the officers, or sometimes even without their knowledge. Conspicuous, above all, in stubborn resistance with the Saluras, whose rage was fired by words rumoured to have been spoken by the Roman general, to the effect that as the Sugambri had been formally destroyed or transplanted into Gaul, so the name of the Saluras ought to be blotted out. Accordingly, they cut off two of our auxiliary cohorts, the rapacity of whose officers let them make incautious forays, and by liberal gifts of spoiling prisoners to the other tribes, they were luring them into revolt. When Ostorius, worn out by the burden of his anxieties, died, to the joy of the Silures. The Silures were eventually conquered. But from Tacitus' account, we can see that the Romans both feared but respected the Silures. And I think the Emperor's decision to ultimately let Caractacus go was one out of respect, not mercy. 
Being that Tacitus' account is pretty much the only written evidence we have to go off on the Sulu res, the rest is down to archaeology. Overlooking the village of Rigos is a mountain called Kraigerlin. Tucked away into the mountainside is a lake, Llinvaur, the big lake. In 1913, a chance discovery made this place famous. A Bronze Age hoard was found. In this hoard were chisels, sickles, socketed axes, a sword, a spearhead, a razor, a horse harness and two bronze cauldrons. The finds were typical of the period, except with one key difference. The sword and one sickle head were made of iron. The sword is thought to have been made in eastern France, but the sickle is local. The sword itself is some of the earliest evidence for iron in the whole of Britain, and the sickle is the earliest evidence of iron working in Britain. Whether the sword got here by trade, or someone from eastern France brought it to the lake, is significant because of how far inland this lake is. It goes without saying that this obviously implies the Salures had international connections. But why bring the sword all the way up here? I think we need to take more notice of the fact that the sword has made its way here. This lake is about as far away from the coast as you can get within Salures territory. I think this area had importance to the Salures Celt on a religious level. We know that the Celts attributed some lakes and specific rivers and waterfalls with their own deities. The fact that these items have been placed in the lake, whole, intact, rather than bent and broken, implies they are an offering, not simply discarded. This lake and the mountain look out over the landscape. It's difficult to see now because of the modern tree plantations, but this would have looked out over an ancient landscape. Three miles northwest of the lake is the village of Penderin. On the hills above Penderin, there have been massive clusters of Bronze Age finds and burials. And down in the valley below is what is affectionately known as Waterfall Country. The village of Pont Nedvechan is surrounded by thick forest, strange geology, many waterfalls and many caves. We know that the Bronze Age and Iron Age Celtic tribes are often attributed certain lakes, rivers, streams and sometimes even rocks with their own gods. Coming to this area in the Bronze or Iron Age must have been magical. With all these things clustered nearby, this must have seemed like the home of the gods. Just like every other Celtic tribe in Britain and across the continent, the religious lives of the Salures Celts in Wales were overseen by the Druids. Given that the Celtic and Druidic traditions were oral and not written, it's unlikely if we ever will know if this was the home of the gods to the local Celts. Given that there is very little written evidence of the Salures at all, let alone their personal and private lives, we must rely on archaeology for the rest. These two copper bowls and tankard were found in Langston near Newport. They give us an idea of the dining scene in an Iron Age roundhouse. Imagine a family gathered around the central hearth of the roundhouse eating their evening meal. But most intriguing to me was the additional find of this, a copper colander. A colander suggests that they were thinking about their cooking, that they were boiling vegetables separate from the rest of their food as opposed to just making stews and simple food. This might indicate a level of banqueting or dining. Although the colander is probably not unique to Wales, it can still give us a better understanding and a clearer picture of our own ancestors' lives. This hoard of finds was found at Nantucaven in the Dilice Valley. The hoard mostly contains tankard handles and horse bridle way. The horse bridle way indicates that the Salures Celts took extra care of their horses and made a statement of showing off by decorating the horses in fancy gear. The tankard handles once again give us a picture of home life in an Iron Age roundhouse. Given that these are more ornately decorated, it would suggest that this area was perhaps more prosperous. In addition to this, 
is that in later years, the Romans would set up forts and establish a Roman road in this area. It would be impossible to mention every single Silures Iron Age find, and for the most part they are indistinct from the rest of Britain. The identity of the Silures seems more of a personal one than a material one. But who knows, hopefully with time, as archaeology progresses, maybe we will discover some lost written evidence, or a stone carving, or just something archaeologically significant to the area. But for now all we can say for sure is that the Silures were a fierce, warlike tribe that instilled fear into the hearts of the Romans and no doubt had a reputation amongst their fellow Celts. Although Rome eventually became the dominant power in Britain, the Silures never died out. They became Romanized, and soon after the departure of the Romans, things kind of went back to the way they were. The kingdoms of Wales split up again and took on new names. Names like Brycheiniog, Gwynedd, Dyved, Powys, Glywasing, Gwent. And these names of these kingdoms are still used to this day. Although the Silures may not have directly called themselves Wales or Cymraeg, they were definitely part of the backbone that forms the modern nation of Wales. And the genetic DNA of these people most definitely still does live on, through the modern Welsh people, through people in England who don't even realise they have Welsh ancestry, to the Welsh Americans, to the Welsh Australians, to the Welsh Canadians, and so on. Although they don't survive in name, they survive through us and through their deeds.